All right, <clears throat> recording is on. Welcome back to the second lecture and lecture hour. Now this should be our last lecture hour for this course. We're just interacting and taking any other questions that people would have and uh, we're just discussing and learning through that. So we go in uh, with questions from Samuel and I think uh, Teresha. So go ahead, Samuel, please, with your question. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, Pastor, one um, kind of like uh, criticism or, yeah, so something um, that I've often seen people point out is um, on, on the Old Testament description of God. Uh, especially on parts where God orders uh, mass murder and genocide uh, kind of thing as Israel is marching into, uh, into the land of Canaan. Um, and also, uh, like, the, 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 the anger, the wrath, uh, the destruction of the nations, uh, Is being threatened. How how would you respond to Sam? Um, Sam, I'm um, kind of lost you a little bit in in between, so um, uh, I I could hear till. Uh, the Old Testament description of God, uh, genocide, and all of that. I lost a little bit. Would you be able to repeat that? Part? Right. Um, the same thing, Pastor. Like, so when um, when people point out um, God, uh, the, the angry God of the Old Testament, who orders mass killings, even you know threatens to wipe out the nation of Israel a couple of times to a point where even Moses intercedes and God changes his mind. So, so on that aspect of God is like I've seen um, that that aspect drawing uh, criticisms um, so just um, in terms of uh, our response uh, a believer's response uh, especially to uh, that uh, that description of God in the Old Testament mm. so you know as far as uh, we you know, our, our understanding is God has not changed, right? Um, the God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. And even in the New Testament, uh, I mean, of, of course, uh, the, the most of the New Testament is you know, the, you know, the four Gospels and the Epistles. But then when you come towards the end of the New Testament, again, you see God you know, who sits as a God who judges, and he's going to judge... Uh, you know, uh, all, the entire human race. And um, he's going to, you know, send many who whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life to an eternal destination uh, separated from him in the lake of fire. So again, you know, that's, that's God who judges. So... Uh, like, like, like the Apostle Paul mentions this. He says, um, uh, I think it's in Romans 11. I'll give you the exact verse. He talks about the goodness. Yeah, Romans 11:22. He talks about the goodness and the severity of God, right? The goodness and severity of God. So, there's the goodness of God, there's the severity of God, and this is in the Old Testament. This is also in the New Testament. God Himself hasn't changed. So he's a loving, compassionate God, but he's also a holy, just, and righteous God, both in the old and the new. So God has not changed. As, as, as believers, we know God has not changed. Now, just that the writings are different in the sense, in the New Testament, of course, it's all about the life of Jesus, and it's about the episodes and helping us understand the cross and how the cross works out in our lives and how we have to live. And so the emphasis is so different. Whereas the Old Testament is leading up to the coming of the Messiah, which is God dealing 
in a natural way with a, with a nation, positioning them and getting them ready for the coming of the Messiah and to understand what the Messiah will do. So it's a lot of natural journey work that's happening. Uh, unlike the New Testament, which is, um, I think Samuel has for, maybe lost his connection. Okay, Samuel, Samuel is still there. Okay, we'll just give Samuel a minute. Yes, Pastor, still here. Still here. Samuel? Okay, okay. Yeah, so the Old Testament was, was God's dealings with this, this, this group of people, bringing them to a place where then the Messiah, Messiah would come. And so the New Testament is the cross and beyond. But God himself hasn't changed. Now, in the process of them making the actual physical journey to occupy their land, the land that was promised to them and them taking possession. Yes, there were battles to fight um, other tribes to overcome. Because obviously another tribe is not going to just vacate because you come here, there's going to be so on, so uh, fighting and possession of territory and so on. And so God is leading his people through those things. And therefore you see God, you know, when in, in the process of leading them, you, see, you, do, you do see God, you know, for, for example, Exodus 15 verse 3 says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a warrior. And uh, now that, you know, it's really jars with our thinking because, hey, God is a warrior. How can you say that? But that's that's one aspect of God. He is Jehovah Nisi. Uh, you know, and as I think Isaiah 40 to 13 says, the Lord is a man of war. He's a mighty warrior. So uh, all of this, you know, uh, in the New Testament, we are told to fight the good fight of faith. So now the, the, the realm of our engagement has changed from the natural to the spiritual, but it's still the same God who empowers us in our spiritual battles. So he's still the warrior God, just that the realm of engagement has moved from natural to spiritual. But the same God, the Lord is a man of war. He hasn't changed. He's still the warrior God. He still empowers us in our spiritual battles. So, So I think when we look at the text in the Old Testament, especially those dealing with, you know, fighting, destruction, and so on, I understand it's a natural journey process. People are moving, they are going to, they have to occupy territory, they have to be positioned where they have to be positioned, and God is taking these people through that. And therefore, there are these engagements, there are these battles, there are, and there is killing, so on. Uh, I think what we can do is to separate that from, okay, that's the natural. The New Testament, we are focusing things on the other side of the cross. Uh, God himself has not changed. He is still, you know, the loving God and as well as the just and the righteous God. And uh, so that we look at things from that perspective. Now to respond to somebody who outside, who questions us about that, uh, and while we can you know, say the things like what I've said, that you know, God doesn't change and, and that this is a natural process of moving a people into a territory. And that's why these fightings and battles and conquering conquests happen. Uh, they may understand it, they may not understand it. But for us personally, at least, it's not a stumbling block. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't change our understanding of who God is. Mm, we know there's the goodness and the severity of God. Uh, God is compassionate. God is righteous. Mm, yeah, that's how I would look at it. Does that help you, Samuel? I'm not sure. It it does. It does, Pastor. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I had another question, um, slightly different, um, but um, I think so. In in regards to Jews, 
see. So I, I've seen a broad spectrum of uh, believers' reactions towards Jews. Like, so there's on one end there is like you know, I hate all Jews because they are the ones who crucified Christ. Uh, to the other side of the spectrum, which is uh, Jews are very special people because they are a uh, chosen uh, nation of uh, God. Uh, so, in, 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 so that being the range, um, so like in moderation, uh, how, not that we interact with Jews a lot, but in, when we do, I mean, one is just the perspective uh, of uh, how do we view Jews? Because you know, when when it comes to uh, looking at people from other religions, like Hindu or Muslim, you can say to a certain extent that they are in darkness and there's idol worship and uh, they've been misleading. But with Jews, is I think there's it's it's a little complex because in one end, uh, it it almost like the the, the oh, they're, they're still. Uh, um, you know, following the Old Testament, at least half the Bible, and, and worshipping uh, God the Father, uh, that aspect. And, and also, like, say, a Jew invites you to uh, observe the Sabbath uh, with him, uh, ask you to participate in Sabbath, and, uh, that, like, would you participate in Sabbath? Um, uh, like, how, how, how do you... Like in in close, like even uh, you know, in practice, maybe in theory, you know, we we have it all sorted out. But when it comes to interacting with the Jew, um, yeah, mm. along those lines, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, from a theological perspective, uh, you know, Paul really explains that for us uh, in Romans chapters. 9, 10, and 11, and uh, also in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but mainly in Romans chapters 9, 10, 11. So essentially what Paul is saying is, you know, uh, temporarily, temporarily, so, so, so there is no question that God, the, the, the Jews are God's special people. So that's how he begins Romans 9. To them were given the covenants, to them were given all the promises, and they were the people God chose, etc. So they are chosen people, no denying of it. But they have, temp they have temporarily rejected Christ. So, uh, so they have rejected Christ. And so, um, now because they want to pursue the law instead of accepting righteousness by faith. That's the end of Romans 9. Uh, and so then what Paul tells us in Romans 10 is, but, you know, they are, while they are trying to receive righteousness by law, we are receiving righteousness through faith in Christ by believing in him and confessing him, believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouths, Romans 10. And this was something already given in the Old Testament when God said he would take the gospel to the Gentiles. And then we come to Romans 11, he says so. And in Romans 11, he, he uses many metaphors, many pictures. And um, he basically says that, look, um, there is the original olive tree, which represents Israel, but now God is grafting in the Gentiles. So Romans 11.25 is probably a verse, Romans 11.25, which sums up everything. What is he saying? That temporarily God has placed on hold, uh, uh, um, or, or temporarily God is focusing on the Gentile world till he brings all the Gentiles in, and then he's going to work salvation among the Jews. So theologically, this is what it is, that they are definitely God's chosen people. But at this moment, it's the period of the gospel, the time of the church, where Romans 11, 25 is at work. God is bringing all the Gentiles in. He's crafting them into the main olive tree. And then he's going to work salvation among the Jews and uh, you know, bring them also to understand the gospel. So that's what God is doing right now. Practically, how do we as believers relate to the Jews? One is, of course, we rec do recognize they are God's special people and God has not abandoned them. But the emphasis that we are to place is on the church and not the Jews, right? because we are part of the church. So our focus is on the church, right? you know, bringing people to be saved, 
and uh, discipling them, which would include the Jews. So and just as we preach the gospel to a Hindu or a Muslim, we preach the gospel to a Jew, invite them to come to faith in Christ. So that's how we interact with the Jew. In the terms of the gospel, it's the same that we would with any other uh, unsaved person. That is, we interact with them as, look, you need to believe in Jesus Christ. Because right now, that's what God is doing, bringing, them, bringing people to faith in Christ. Um, thirdly is, should the church embrace the practices of Judaism? Answer is no. That's a big mistake many in the Western church are making. Uh, where, you know, they're just kind of going back into Judaism. I'm talking about believers, the people part of the church. You know, they, they want to keep all these feasts and they think they're becoming closer to Jesus by practicing Judaism. But that's the actual opposite of the gospel. The gospel is taking people out of those practices into simple faith in Christ. Paul explains in Romans chapter 7, we are dead to the law so that we can be married to Christ. We are dead to the law so that we could serve God in the newness of the spirit. And uh, there are these this whole movement of Christians back into Judaism. They think they're getting closer to Jesus, but it's not true. Now, so that's that's something we should avoid. You know, stay in the liberty uh, in, of the gospel and not get trapped into the keeping of the feasts and things like that. Now, if a Jew were to invite me to come and sit or for a Shabbat or come and observe you know, Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement or something. You know, I would go for the experience once just to just experience like, well, what, what it is because then it helps us understand the Bible better and understand, you know, some of these things better. But I do it just for the experience, not because, or, and just, you know, it's as a one-time thing, not something that I want to practice in my life for the rest of my life as a Christian. Uh, I would definitely step, go there and sit and experience it because it will help us understand things in the Bible better. And from that perspective, I would accommodate that request or even be interested uh, more of a learning, but not necessarily as a spiritual enhancement or, you know, of course, God can speak to our hearts and give us revelation and understanding through the process. But our focus is on the person of Christ and not on, you know, the practices of these things. I hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, for both my questions, um, uh, you you gave me references from Romans, from the book of Romans. Um, and, and so it just makes me want to go back to Romans and, and do a more in-depth study. But this helps a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Christopher, you've, you had your hand raised for a long time. Your question, please. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, just looking at, you know, at kind of reviewing this, uh, this entire course and, uh, you know, there is obviously a lot of, uh, you know, fundamental uh, uh, areas that have been touched, you know, from, from a point of view of, you know, uh, defending the faith. And uh, you also touched upon, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, some of the, um, some of the things that are happening, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the current uh, environment. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, maybe I missed it. Uh, you, you know, maybe I'm not sure how much you covered on the cults. And um, um, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm not. My question is not specifically about about cults, but uh, more about uh, you know the um, um, uh, this entire uh, you know environment that um, the the new millennia is um, is being exposed to. You know, around the internet and um, um uh, you know and the, in and the influence of that and uh, how the uh, you know how the evil one has uh, permeated a lot of the uh, a lot of the internet um really my question is about um what would be um possibly a different approach to how we um deal with the the new millennium uh, and the younger generation um, around, um, uh, you know, question of apologetics and uh, being able to, um, you know, get them, you know, 
get that move, you know, from from where they may be, uh, you know, to to you know what is uh, what is available and you know what is being provided by by God. Um, and uh, uh, so, what would be the different approach, and uh, you know how we could you know actually get them to uh, you know get that move uh, and make that more stronger. Uh, because uh, I think there is definitely um, uh, uh, I mean, a large proportion of um, you know teenagers and uh, the youth who are uh, moving moving away from you know the traditional sort of church and uh, even from God and uh, you know, how 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 Christian politics I mean the entire uh, you know how that defending of the faith can be can be done. Uh, with them, so that's really my question. Mm. Now, <laughs> and, I, and I'm just uh, you know sharing my thoughts. This is not some uh, prepared, <laughs> well uh, curated uh, answer. Just maybe I would say random thoughts. One is uh, definitely. Uh, these are very challenging times to be a believer, to be a Christian, and definitely very challenging for you know the younger, younger generation for the reasons you've pointed out. You know, um, so you know, technology is good, but then technology itself can become a channel through which a lot of wrong information is disseminated very easily and is also very accessible easily. Uh, technology can also be uh, debilitating in the sense that the younger generation is spending so much time not on really deep work, but on very fluffy kind of things, you know, social media and those kinds of things, which are very entertaining, but they're not really deep work. And so the entire attention span is, you know, reducing drastically, so on. And, uh, and uh, um, so, so, so it's very challenging. And, 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 and added to all of this, you know, I'm so, I'm so troubled by the way the Western church is going. You know, uh, when you look at, when I say Western church, I'm really pointing to America and Australia primarily. Uh, you know, th these two uh, regions that were, and, and UK, where, which were once, you know, the, the strong basis for missionaries and, you know, the, the godly influence to brought into the world. But today, you know, if you look at the church, especially in America, it's, it's, it's so sad, it's so sad. Um, and so, you know, what should we do? What should we do? And I think one is we need just to stay with what we are really called to do, which is to preach and teach the word of God. Uh, and embody, you know, embody Christ likeness. Um, because there's that itself is a very powerful testimony to the younger generation that what we believe is so real. Because what 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 the younger generation is seeing, and if you look at what's happening in America, is there's a whole movement of people out of the church because they're so disillusioned with the church, especially even the I mean both the evangelical church and the charismatic spiritual side, just a solution by the, the disparity between what we say we believe and how we live, you know, and that especially when this is embodied in quote unquote Christian leaders who are supposed to be representing Jesus to us, but then they're living dual lives uh, and uh, they, they preach something and live totally something different. Then obviously, you know, the church loses tremendous respect, uh, loses respect in the eyes of the younger generation saying, hey, why should I even bother listening? 
because uh, your life doesn't match what you're preaching, you know? And so this is a big disparity. So what should we do? I think, you know, what the church needs is just, hey, just keep it simple. Stay with the word of God and live Christ-like. You know, because if we don't live this Christian life, there is no amount of ministry that we do that's going to impact the next generation. They're going to see the, they're going to see this, and if we want to use the word hypocrisy, because we are saying something, we are living something different. You know, and yeah, younger generation aren't going to be impressed with our preaching if our life doesn't match it. So I think, you know, this is so important. We've got to live the life. We've got to be Christ-like. And uh, at least then we can, you know, say that, look, this Jesus thing is real, right? And then, of course, you know, as far as technology itself is concerned, it, you know, we can't, we can't rein that in, in the sense it is what it is. Uh, there's, there's the, there is the internet. There are all kinds of platforms, and every other day you have somebody starting their channel and talking what they want and saying what they want. I mean, we can't stop that. Uh, it is what it is. But if the young people see a true reflection of what the church is supposed to be then they will hope, most likely gravitate towards that and choose that instead of, you know, the numerous voices that are there online and all the things that are being put out there online. Because we can't fight that. You know, you, we can't fight with every <laughs> person who's putting stuff out on, on online. It's, they're going to keep doing it. It's just going to keep getting more and more. But what we can do, the church can do is Lift the word of God, teach the word of God, and embody Christ likeness. You know, and stay away from things that are divisive, hurtful, abusive, uh, political in nature. Stay away from those things. Just stay with the word and be Christ like. And that I think will impact, I believe, will impact the younger generation much more than all the other things we do. That's just my rand random thoughts in response to your question. But I believe that, I believe that. Okay. Yes, Samuel, I see a question about dinos dinosaurs. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Uh, apart from that, on Chris, on, on the current topic that we're talking about, Master, um, it, so, I mean, one one perspective that I have is uh, you know, the church is trying to, in in some ways, innovate uh, in order to attract, keep, uh, however you want to call it, the the younger generation that's coming, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and which uh, which is I think practical because uh, now with social media coming up. With new technology, new gadgets, worship has changed, the way sermons are being preached has changed, the way engagement is happening is being changed. Um, we are no longer in the era where you know, the Bible was accessible only to scribes and the educated. So, so I think so. On so on one end, so the, I think the balance between. Um, I'm just searching for the question, but the balance between innovating um, so that uh, it's relevant to the Christians who are growing up in this age, but at the same time, not like completely getting lost in that. I mean, especially I think uh, there's a lot of criticism around um, you know, how worship which which is meant to praise God, but because the worship leader and the music has gone so good that worship leaders get worshipped in, in, in some way, or even the worship itself gets worshipped. Mm. So so I think that 
that I see is like the the necessity at the same time the danger of innovation and in getting good. Uh, so just some thoughts around that also, because this is such an interesting topic for me. So let's just jump in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I mean to answer your question, you know, you know uh, simply in in a short sentence, the answer is definitely um, the church needs to be relevant in the sense that it should, you know, definitely use, um, uh, make use of, especially urban churches, right? But make use of uh, uh, resources, technologies, uh, the audiovisual tools and all of that uh, media to reach out and minister to the young people. So definitely the answer is yes. But yet we can learn a lot from what's going on or what has happened in the Christian world, especially in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And uh, I have been spending quite some time just uh, following, you know, at this moment, there are two big churches. One is Hillsong from Australia and the other one is of course, uh, Mars Hill from, from the United States, which, which has wrapped up. But uh, there are these two big case studies that are being investigated or looking looked at very closely uh, 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 and now Hillsong, of course, for the last 30 some plus years has done a lot. Uh, they've become like a big production house itself. Uh, but what is actually happening inside? You know, you, you have to listen to the insider stories and experiences to know, okay, we are being contemporary. Uh, we are, you know, using these tools, but in the process, how are we impacting lives? What's happening to the actual people who are serving and making these productions happen week after week? You know, because every Sunday is a big production. There's all these things happening on stage. And of course, you know, you've, you, you are impacting thousands of people, but what's happening to the people serving in the church? the local church to make these productions happen week after week and sometimes several times during the week. Uh, same thing with Mars Hill Church, which uh, which wrapped up in 2014, but you know, there's a lot of things going on about that. I mean, you, and people are investigating, trying to understand, okay, here was a very contemporary cutting edge church in America at one point. But what happened to the people? You know, uh, uh, again, it was leveraging technology. It was based in Seattle, one of the, you know, high tech uh, centers and and so on. And so, what 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 actually happened to the people? And what happened? You know, how was media being used? And so, so there are a lot of lessons coming out of it. You know, uh, so answer is yes, we should be contemporary. But let's not make the same mistakes that have been made over the last thirty years. You know, and. Uh, for example, uh, you know, just listening to, again, this this was from Hillsong, New York, uh, and, and, and and if you if you know the story of, Hill, I mean, what's happened to Hillsong, New York, and so on, it's just very sad. But I look at the insider story, and you know, this was somebody who was uh, the stage director, and she was serving there, and it was basically like everybody's serving a man's vision. You know, everybody's helping put up a good production Sunday after Sunday. But what's happening to that, that person, that individual, you know, or the individuals who are serving, you know, and yes, we want to be contemporary. Yes, we are putting out this, you know, postmodern type of service, casual and entertaining, exciting, et cetera. But what's happening, Who, who's the one making it happen? And all, I mean, you look at all these details, you know, we, it just says like, look, we've got to be careful that while we definitely need to use tools, technologies, we shouldn't deviate from the Christ likeness that we're supposed to embody as ministers of God and as a church of God. That's number one, more important than being contemporary. And I agree, we have to be contemporary. We have to relate to the, the youth but not at the sake of compromising being like Jesus, you know, uh, 
first be like Jesus, then use the tools. You know, this is what I would just say. Yeah. Okay. Christopher, uh, you have a question yeah, yeah. or comment? Yeah, just a follow-up uh, comment. And um, you know, I mentioned earlier about you know like a different approach. And um, uh, I guess where I, what I was trying to imply is that um, I think these are also times you know when there's there's there appears to be uh, a level of uh, aggression and. Uh, a level of, uh, I maybe mean, in the Bible we, you know, there there are times when we refer, you know, to the devil as a as a as a roaring lion, and uh, um, you know, um, I guess I'm just trying to get it to how um, um, Christians um, uh, and possibly in the uh, apologetics area. Um, what is the you know sort of the level of intensity that is that is um, you know ex exhibited by by you know by um, uh, that um, that group of people or you know that um, uh, that body of uh, you know of, uh, of believers? I mean, I'm talking about the apologetic area, and uh, to counter some of this that is that is happening, you know. Um, um, because we, do, we, I mean, there's also reference in the Bible, you know, when we are as believers, we are, we are uh, expected to be, you know, having that, uh, you know, uh, you know, coat of armor or that you know, breastplate of, uh, sorry, I can't remember the exact mm -hmm. words. You know? So um, uh, I'm just thinking that, you know, it, it, I mean, uh, I mean, this is just a comment, you know, I mean. Uh, this could be, you know, a comment which I, where I'm saying that, you know, we seem to be on the back foot rather than, you know, really, you know, uh, trying to, you know, um, aggressively counter some of the stuff that's happening on the internet as well as, you know, you know, the, the evil that's, you know, some of the evil that's been permeated in the in the world. Mm. Yeah, definitely we need to, uh, you know, make our voice heard. Uh, so we need to speak out or, you know, let let the truth be known. And, and, I, and I thank God for, um, you know, especially uh, Christians, people of faith who are also uh, qualified, maybe either as scientists or others, you know, in, in, in a scholarly way to be able to respond to what's there. So, and I think the church is doing, the church means the body of Christ at large is, is, is doing there. God has raised up people who are uh, responding, providing answers, and all, and all of these things are being available online, being put out online. So um, to that extent, uh, work is happening and, and God has raised up people who are making their voices heard uh, on these different uh, themes around apologetics and uh, information is available, you know, in for young people to go, people to go and explore and listen to and find answers. Uh, yeah, some, that's my observation. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if you were getting at something else, Christopher. I mean, it's just a, just a thought here, and that is, you know, the level of intensity. Again, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know, you know, whether that's, that's happening or not. Um, uh, but I mean, you know, if you look at uh, possibly, um, and this is probably in the, in the more in the Indian context, but if you look at, you know, some of the other religions uh, where they are, you know, seem to be more, you know, uh, clear about, you know, what, how they stand and, uh, you know, they will not, uh, uh, you know, um, um, have you know anything against certain principles that they that they have, you know. Uh, so um, uh, versus you know the Christians who seem to be a little more on the on the on the back foot, you know. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Let me see now. I look at what. Uh, um, yeah, so about dinosaurs, um, Samuel B. did uh, kind of do a little brief. Um, this is in one of the PDFs, which is actually uh, page 36, and lesson number eight, uh, additional questions on science and creation. Uh, we did mention um, um, uh, di about dinosaurs and uh, and I think a good uh, website, answeringgenesis.org, has uh, a quite a detailed response. I'll just put it here. Uh, answering A N S W E. Uh, answering Genesis. A N S W R I N G. Answering Genesis. Okay. So answering Genesis. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay, there's only one G, oh, my mistake. So answering uh, uh, Genesis, so there's one, just one G. So that has, um, this website has answering and they've just used one G, answering Genesis, and Genesis, Genesis, okay. So uh, they have a good write-up on, on, on uh, you know, the response to <laughs> dinosaurs. Essentially the answer is that dinosaurs uh, or these huge animals uh, are not as old as they are supposedly claimed to be because you know uh, their bones have not been fossilized and I'm just looking at the notes here that uh, red, blood, the red blood cells and protein tissue protein other soft tissues and DNA have been found on some of these fossils so uh, and if you actually look at how this whole thing has been happening, they claim something, then that claim is retracted. Uh, they, you know, call something as so many years old, and then they that's retracted. And they say, oh no, this is actually the bone of something else. So if you look into the depth of or the deep things in detail, uh, this is what is happening in that whole space. That one is that um, uh, these bones are not as old as they are claimed to be. And second, many times uh, initial statements about these bones are then retracted quietly, but the public is left with the impression that, okay, you know, these were what was originally claimed. But all that information is available there answering Genesis. And so um, uh, our response is, okay, these animals were created there in Genesis chapter one, uh, when animals were created, I think on day five or something. Uh, and, uh, and 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 whatever God created was there, and of course, you know, they, so you know, over time things have been going, animals have been going extinct, and they're still today. That's happening. We're very aware, and we're trying to preserve uh, the life of certain animals, but animals or birds, but things have been going extinct. But they're not as old as uh, claimed to be when you look at um, things closely. And information is out there on in answering Genesis. Okay. Okay, we'll take a last question from Mangi and then we're going to pray. Mangi, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's not it's, it's not a question, it's just uh not adding to the dinosaur dinosaur question. Um if I'm if I'm correct, in uh in Texas there's a, a a rock where the footprint of dinosaur and human. So my question, not question, <laughs> just adding to the question that so if a human footprint and dinosaur footprint were all imprinted at same time, so at same age, how 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 can the dinosaur be millions of years old if they were still alive when human were walking on the world? And that if if they were alive when human were working working on the world, so that means uh, even it might not be written in written form. That means human saw dinosaur, and it's it's not long long ago that they were they were on Earth. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie, for sharing. 
Okay. So we're going to take some time, Charles. Charles, your question. It's not a question, Pastor. It's uh, it's an appreciation and thank you uh, for for the time you spend in researching because we can't take it for granted. Um, we, we, I would like to, to move a vote of thanks um, for the work that you do, especially in researching, in praying to get this, that even allowing the Lord to reveal this information to you so that you are able to store it for memory because, again, information can come and it can be lost. But I appreciate the fact of storage in writing, in the electronic format, but also in human interface. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. Hopefully, hopefully we get to meet someday. <laughs> I know we're all in different parts. I am world. coming for my graduation. I'll oh. come for graduation. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah I believe God. <laughs> Wonderful. Good. All right, so let's uh, take a moment to pray as we close off this, uh, this course. And I want to thank all of you for being part of this course uh, and just uh, interacting, learning, asking questions, discussing. I uh, appreciate you doing that. Okay. So we're going to pray together a um, couple of minutes, uh, pray, and then we will dismiss. And of course, we will meet uh, right after the break in uh, the Keys to Supernatural Ministry class. So I uh, just request uh, one person to please pray with all of us, and uh, we will then dismiss. Who wants to pray? Can I pray, Pastor? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful journey that you've given to us, O God. Thank you for the word of wisdom and Lord and Master enlightening, Lord and Master of our knowledge. We thank you for the wonderful word, O Lord Master, strengthening our faith, strengthening, giving us, giving us more, sh more sharper knowledge on your word. And Lord Master, you are clearing our doubt. I thank you for your servant of God. Lord and Master, you blessed his wisdom, you blessed his tongue. Lord Master, release the right word, Father God. I thank you for everyone, O oh Father God, Lord Master, who, who all are blessed through his word and Father God, which is strengthen, strengthening every day, O oh Lord, in our in our walk with you. And Father God, let these words, O oh Lord Master, let it not be taken away from our heart, but let these words, O oh Father God, bring fruit, fruit in our life, O oh God. Let the, mm -hmm. let the crisis and the challenges of the world, the temptations of the world should not choke these revelations, but help mm -hmm. us to stand strong. Help us to, as Jesus said, help us to build our faith on the stone, on the rock of Father God. When the winds and the waves come against, oh Father God, against us, against against our ministry, against our against our walk with you, oh Lord Master, let these words, oh Father God, able to strengthen us, oh Father God, and let we able to be fruitful, and let we able to fight this, Lord Master, this the the fight of this this fight with faith of Father God. As the Paul said, I fought a good fight of faith and I pray for the same thing for the pastor that let he also could be able to fight a good fight of faith of God. And as you have given that strength and wisdom that we all should be trained under him, so the Father, we pray that the grace which is flowing in his life, Lord, as we are also partnering with him, O Lord, give us the same grace that we could able to fight the Lord Master a good fight of faith. Thank you once again mm -hmm. for giving us this grace to stand together and listen as word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we won't have class next week. Just look out for any assignment that we uh, put out, finish it, and uh, we'll be done. Okay? Thank you. I appreciate all of you. God bless you all. See you uh, after the break. And uh, we'll meet you in the next class. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. 
Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for all your comments there in the chat. See them. Thank you. God bless. God bless you. Okay. See you shortly in the next class. Bye now.